Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. Welcome to our latest episode, Uncovering the UAE as the Ultimate Trust and Foundation Planning Jurisdiction. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about why, in my opinion, the UAE is currently the number one trust and foundation planning jurisdiction out there. I'm going to explain the UAE's trust and foundation offering, including some of its unique features, as well as why the UAE has become such an attractive jurisdiction. The UAE offers trusts and foundations in three of its free zones. In the Abu Dhabi Global Markets Free Zone, or ADGM for short, in the DIFC, which is the Dubai International Financial Center, and in RAC ICC, the Raz Al Khaimah International Corporate Center. Now, RAC ICC only offers foundations for the time being. Trust may come in the future. Now, the laws under each one of these free zone regimes are a bit different. I'm mostly going to talk about DIFC because it's the one I deal with the most. So, why has the UAE become such a popular jurisdiction for trusts and foundations? Well, first, it's politically and economically stable. Second, it's an independent country. It's not a member of the EU or a crown dependency, so it's less susceptible to outside pressure. So if, for example, you're, the jurisdiction you're contemplating is within the EU, it's going to be susceptible to the pressures of the EU, or if it's a crown dependency, it's going to be susceptible to the pressures of the UK. It's also not a tax haven. Right? I mean, the UAE does have a corporate income tax, and it is a world financial center. I mean, there's a lot of business going on here. So I think from a perception standpoint, this is very positive. A lot of times, if you go set up a trust or foundation in one of the islands, people kind of look at it as, oh, you're only there because they don't have any taxes, or you're only there because of the strong asset protection. And they can look at it a little bit negatively sometimes. Whereas the UAE has a real economy that's very robust and there's a lot of different business reasons to be here. Now, trusts and foundations are also relatively new to the UAE. I believe the first foundation law came into effect in 2017. So its foundation trust laws are quite modern. It's also very easy and cost effective to set up a trust or foundation in the UAE compared with other jurisdictions. Also, the administration requirements in the UAE for a trust or foundation are a lot less than in other jurisdictions. So, for example, a lot of jurisdictions re require what is known as a local administrator. And the administrator must be officially appointed to be the administrator of the foundation, for example, and they're charged with making sure that that trust or foundation, you know, keeps its corporate governance in order, complies with all the local laws, gets renewed on time, all of that kind of stuff. Now, that is a good thing. And you need to do that regardless of where you set up your trust or foundation. The problem is a lot of people, especially privacy-oriented people, don't like having this third party all up in their business. Now, the UAE does not require an outside administrator. You can do this yourself, or you can bring somebody in like a corporate secretary to ensure that this is done. The only thing that you're required to have is a licensed registered agent in one of the free zones. The UAE also does not have any requirements for you to have a local counselor or director. A lot of jurisdictions require you to have a local director or counselor on the board. Now, effectively, it does make a lot of sense to have a local director in the UAE because the UAE, like a, like a lot of other jurisdictions, has economic substance regulations which require that the core income generating activities of the entity happen within the jurisdiction, right? So in this case, within the UAE. So without uh, a local counselor or counselors, it's very difficult to argue that those core income generating activities are happening within, within the UAE. So it is nice that there's, there's not this requirement like there are in other jurisdictions, but you still do have to be mindful 
that the core income generating activities of the, the trust or foundation are happening within the UAE. And usually that just means that your board meetings need to take place here. So a lot of people that may not be residents of the UAE decide to self-manage their foundation. They travel here a couple times a year to do board meetings. Another nice feature of the UAE's regime is that inbound and outbound migrations of trusts and foundations is allowed. So that means if you have a trust or foundation in another jurisdiction and you want to move it to the UAE, you can. Also, if you have a trust or foundation in the UAE, for whatever reason you find it beneficial to move it somewhere else, you can do that too. Another nice feature is that they don't recognize foreign force airship laws. So a lot of countries, for example, have laws that say, okay, if you die, your assets need to be distributed this way. So let's say, for example, you lived in such a country, but you also had a UAE foundation and the court in the country where you live gave an order saying, hey, your assets need to be divvied up like this. In DIFC, at least, that would not be recognized because there's no recognition of forced airship laws. Now, one of the other big benefits of the UAE, which a lot of other trust and foundation planning jurisdictions don't have, is the UAE is party to 137 tax treaties. That's more than Switzerland. Now, foundations generally have access to these tax treaties, and the tax treaties can make it much less costly from a tax perspective to repatriate income such as dividends to the UAE because you would usually be entitled to a lower withholding tax on those dividends in the source country. The UAE also has private rather than public beneficial owner registers with respect to foundations. There are no registers whatsoever for trusts. They don't need to be registered anywhere. There's no beneficial owner registers for trusts, nothing like that. Now, the UAE also isn't subject to a regulation known as DAC-6, which is an EU law. And what DAC-6 essentially says is if you're engaged in aggressive tax planning, your lawyer, tax advisor, accountant, or whatever is supposed to report you to the tax authorities in whatever EU member country. Now, a lot of times you might not even be engaged in aggressive tax planning, but because your advisor's overly cautious, they may report you anyway, which could cause you some problems having to fight with the tax authority. Because the UAE is not part of the EU, there's no DAC-6. Now, another thing which I think a lot of people are less familiar with is there's something known as the multilateral instrument. Now, this is a multi-party agreement. Most of the countries throughout the world have become a party to this multilateral instrument. And the multilateral instrument contains a provision that's called the principal purpose test. And what this test says is, is if the principal purpose of a transaction was to obtain a tax benefit, then that tax benefit can be denied. So one of the things that you have to be mindful of, for example, is if you're setting up a trust or foundation, conducting a transaction through a traditional trust or foundation planning jurisdiction, where really the only benefit is no tax, that could be problematic because under the MLI, they could say, well, you moved here only to obtain the tax benefit, so we're going to deny that tax benefit. Because the UAE is such a robust and real economy, there's a lot of business reasons to be here, irrespective of tax. So the MLI, I believe, is much less impactful when you're looking at doing transactions through the UAE. As many of you know, one of the biggest issues when setting up any kind of a structure these days is obtaining banking. Now, I'm not saying that getting banking in the UAE is easy, but it is a lot easier than it is in other countries. Also, UAE trusts and foundations are pretty well recognized, and most Swiss banks or Liechtenstein banks, for example, would be happy to open accounts for a UAE trust or foundation. Now, I also said I wanted to touch on some of the unique features of the UAE trust and foundation law. I'm going to touch first on some of the unique features of the foundation law, especially with respect to DIFC, because like I said, it's what I'm most familiar with. So one of the things that's allowed is the mergers of foundations, right? So two or more foundations can merge together. They can also split apart. You also have the ability to convert a company into a foundation or a foundation into a company. Now, this might be something very beneficial. Let's say, for example, you have a family holding company that owns all of your family's assets. You could, rather than 
creating a new foundation and transferring that holding company into the foundation, you could convert that company into a foundation. I think it's a pretty unique feature. One of the other things that I think is really cool is this concept of what's known as a deposit receipt, right? So sometimes somebody may want to fund a foundation, so put money into a foundation, but they don't actually want to give it away so that it becomes the foundation's assets. With deposit receipts, you could, for example, deposit money into a foundation in exchange for a deposit receipt, right? So you could say, okay, I'm going to put a million dollars into this foundation. I'm going to get a deposit receipt in return. And you can specify what the criteria for this deposit receipt are, right? Like, okay, maybe if you hand in your deposit receipt, you can get the payment upon presenting your deposit receipt for redemption. Maybe it's tied to some asset in, the, in a foundation, right? You say, okay, if this asset sold, the deposit receipt needs to be repaid. This is a pretty unique way to split the legal and economic title of uh, an asset by using deposit receipts. I think that's a very cool feature. I haven't seen that anywhere else. It might exist, but I haven't seen it anywhere. So a, a good example of how this works, right, is let's say, for example, you wanted to buy a house, right? Now, if anybody ever asked you, do you own this house? You would have to say, yes, I own this house. Well, an alternative would be, let's say, for example, you set up the foundation, you deposit a million dollars, you get a deposit receipt in return, and the deposit receipt contains a provision that says, okay, if this house is sold, then the deposit receipt needs to be repaid. If someone asks you now, do you own the house? The answer is no, because it's owned by the foundation, but you still have an economic interest through this deposit receipt. I think it's a really, really cool feature, like I said. Trusts are only offered in ADGM and DIFC. They're not offered in RAC ICC. The, both the ADGM and DIFC trust laws are very, very flexible. Like I said, they also provide very robust privacy because one, trusts don't need to be registered, and two, there's no beneficial owner register with respect to trust. You can also, if you don't want to use a professional trustee to manage your trust, you can use what's known as a private trust company. Now, in most countries, the private trust company has to be a company, right? And then you have succession issues because somebody has to own this company, and what happens to that private trust company when the owner dies? Well, one of the cool things in DIFC is foundations can act as the private trust company. So you could set up, for example, a, 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 what we call a purpose foundation, whose only purpose is to act as a trustee of this particular trust and doesn't have any beneficiaries. So this way, you sort of avoid the succession issues with the private trust company. It's a really cool feature because before that, in, in most jurisdictions, if you wanted sort of an orphan structure, you needed to set up the private trust company, which was a company, and then you needed to put the shares of that private trust company into a purpose foundation in order to solve the succession issue. Because of this unique law in the DIFC, you can essentially avoid the need for the extra private trust company because the foundation itself can act as the private trust company. One of the other very unique features in ADGM and, and, and DIFC, as well as RAC ICC, is you can choose to be, or, or they are subject to the common law courts of ADGM and DIFC. So ADGM and DIFC have its own courts that are based on common law, and those would be the courts that would govern an ADGM trust or foundation, depending on which one it was formed in. Now, RAC ICC does not have its own court system, but RAC ICC foundations can choose whether they want to be under the jurisdiction of the DIFC, ADGM, or Dubai courts. But Dubai courts generally is not the preference because they're not so familiar with you know, trusts and foundations as a, a common law court of ADGM or DIFC would be. Now, the UAE has also created a federal trust law. So this is a trust that is not formed in a free zone. It, it's, it's formed under the, the federal law of the UAE. And it, it's sort of a unique concept because it's, it's a trust with legal personality. You normally trusts are just contracts, so they don't really have a legal personality, but the UAE federal trust is actually an incorporated trust. So it has some legal personality. Now, 
One of the big advantages of a UAE federal trust is that it can easily own assets throughout the UAE. This can sometimes be challenging using, for example, a foundation that is formed in a free zone within one emirate and then wants to own property in another emirate can some, sometimes be a little bit challenging. You can alleviate that challenge by using a UAE federal trust. Uh, I actually did a Bloomberg article a while back on why I think the UAE is a trust and foundation planning powerhouse. I will put a link to it down in the description. Now, one of the other things that's kind of cool that I, I thought worth mentioning is that the DIFC recently opened the very first Family Wealth Center. And the purpose of the Family Wealth Center is basically to help families get proper governance and succession planning in place so that to help ensure the long-term financial success of families. Because a lot of times, family wealth disappears in three generations. So the Family Wealth Center, one, they have a database of accredited advisors that can help you get proper corporate governance and, and proper succession planning in place. But you can also get certified by the Family Wealth Center that you have proper corporate governance and succession planning in place, which I think is, is a huge advantage. I also did a Bloomberg article about the Family Wealth Center. I'll also put that link down in the description. So to recap, we've covered the UAE's trust and foundation offering, including some of its unique features. We've also covered why the UAE has become such an attractive trust and foundation planning jurisdiction. So if you're thinking about setting up a trust or foundation, you should really give the UAE some serious consideration. I hope you found this episode useful. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.